So Cole's fired again. Yeah, this guy trying to coordinate three people to meet up that are busy. But what the hell? That's like his only job. Yeah, does he even have a job? No, this is his job. This is his job. Like, and he's not good at it. Speaking of which, I have no job anymore. So he's taking from my table, from my mouth, and he's not even here. How does it feel to be jobless? Kind of friendless. Nice. No, it's kind of good. Helpless, hopeless. <laughs> Life's got a lot different for me, but I, I, uh, I can't say I don't enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Your life, it's like a cartoon. I feel like I'm watching a movie, but it's like a tragedy. <laughs> like, well, I'm watching the life of Brandon unfold before my eyes. Well, all right. Like on a seri- on like a weird, like serious note, like I-, I guess ever since I was probably 16, I've been working three jobs. Like always been three jobs, you know, between training, teaching classes, working two real jobs. Only three? Uh, I know. Only three plus training. And so this is like the first time in my life where like, well, now it's embarrassing. I have to tell people like, what do you do for work? I'm a... I'm a podcaster. <laughs> How horrible does that sound? I'm a podcaster. But, so I'm, uh, I'm a YouTuber. Do you make any money? No. But uh, yeah. maybe eventually. But, I mean, that's what it's come to. And, and honestly, like my real job, like they could tell I wasn't focused. And they're just like, hey, take a break for a little while. You can come back, but you need to be focused. And I was like, you're not wrong. Like they, they hit the nail on the head. They hit the nail on the unfocused head over so, there. So now on real, you know, real stuff, like this is my full-time gig. And, uh, and honestly, I just got to bet on myself and I always have, and I went to Vegas last week and I actually wanted to talk about that because you spent oh, yeah. an eternity in Vegas, dude, I spent so long in Vegas. That's why you guys, even this show, by the time you see it, it's going to be late, later than usual. We try to record on Monday, get it out on Tuesday, but man, I just got back on from like nine, 10 days in Vegas, uh, just on Sunday. And then I, you know, just didn't have any time to watch film or anything I'm like, man, I got to function a little bit beforehand, but. That was rough. That was a brutal time in Vegas because I'm bored out of my mind in a hotel room. I had Casey Tanner fighting Contender Series, and oh gosh, that one kills me. Um, Are we allowed to tell the the story? I mean, that seems fine. I'm going to like I don't care. Like five minutes before we go out to fight, Casey, you know Eddie Cha and I are back there, and Junior Cortez is back there warming up Casey because my ankle like snapped off. I literally, you guys, this is what old age is. I had my feet on the bed. I uncrossed my ankles in mid air, like didn't even touch anything. My ankle, right ankle like snaps and it just like locks up and I literally couldn't walk on it or move. And it was swollen and pregnant for like still to this day. I mean, it's ridiculous. So I couldn't warm Casey up. So junior had to come back and warm him up, but he calls us over. He's like, Hey, you guys, I'm going to be real. He's like, I can't wrestle at all right now. And we're like, what? And he's like, my stomach is so wrecked. He's like, even as Junior and him were warming up, Junior would like grab a body lock in case he was like, stop. Just like he had to stop. He couldn't, it was in so much pain. And, you know, he ate a bad meal after the weigh-ins and the rehydration and stuff. And he was sick. Like almost immediately after he ate it, he tried to go to the bathroom and like try and throw it up. He couldn't throw it up. So then he was taking like charcoal pills to try to like, make his stomach not as upset but honestly all the way from that would have been monday after he weighed in he was like queasy and kind of sick all day tuesday even in the morning he's like eating breakfast he's like i still don't feel right and it is what it is man it's it's a fight game you don't always and still was one of the better fights that dana had ever seen shook both their hands still pushed through yeah yeah he actually gave casey his win money said man that it was only the second time he'd ever been in the cage in the entirety of the contender series wow. came backstage and said dude i actually had casey stay out for the whole week on dana's dime uh i told him to go to the pi get a bunch of um you know rehab on his leg and everything I said go get one win and we will sign you you belong here with us so that's awesome it was it, it was bittersweet i mean casey's a, a a hard worker that's his first loss he was undefeated as a pro. He was 9-0 as an amateur. So, you know, but he said, he's like, look, I know I have more to give. That wasn't my best performance, but I know that I left everything in the cage on that night. That, it, that's all you can ask for. That's something that you've always told me since the very beginning is like, I'm going to give every single thing that I have. And if they beat me, then so be it. They're just a better man that night. But as long as I gave everything that I needed to up in preparation and in the fight. Yeah, and, and I said it actually, you know, I always say it. If you give everything that you can give and you perform – and that guy beats you, hats off to him. Yep. And, and I said that with Matsumoto, and I, I was saying that, like, man, because Casey is so good, and we know that. And I was like, man, if this guy can beat Casey, then hats off to him. So 
man, hats off to you, Gene, Gene John Matsumoto. Um, hell of a performance. Now, any other funny uh, anecdotes or like notes from the week that you were there? So that fight happens. You still stay in Vegas Tuesday. Yes. Uh, and then leading up for Tracy, Tracy. Fight. Yeah. Tracy came in and, and, you know, a few things with that, that was crazy too. Um, one the smackdown on Canada. Yeah. One, we didn't stay at the New York, New York hotel. We, we got an Airbnb and that was really difficult. It sounds dumb, but it was 25 minutes away. And so just everything we had to do was at the New York, New York. And we'd have to drive back and forth, and there's construction all over Vegas. It's really hard to get around. Vegas isn't even fun to drive in when there's no construction. It's bad. And uh, so that was just really hard and difficult. And then, you know, of course, I, I knew of the situation before Tracy did, but unfortunately, um, you know, somebody really close to Tracy passed away and was sick. And then she ended up finding out the day before the fight, so after the weigh-ins, somebody called her. And so that was weighing on her really heavily. It's not a super big secret. It was Henry Cejudo's sister, Gloria. Um, yes. That's already pretty public, and he's already Okay, I, you know, I, yeah. I, I don't know. It's just not I, – I'm, I'm a pretty private person. I don't want to air anyone's, like, You know, she dedicated the uh, she dedicated the victory to her publicly, so it's, okay. it's not – it's above board. It's not like so, – So people know that. And then Tracy had, like, whatever you people think you know, you don't. She had so much adversity leading up to this fight and, and just so much over the last, you know, six months to a year – um, and she just, I always say there are two people that I've never worried about performing since I've met them. And that was Henry Cejudo and Tracy Cortez. Like, I know that no matter what happens, that girl is going to show the F up and handle some shit. And she does. She's I like gangster. how you say show the F up, but then say shit the next word. Well, my <laughs> kids are here. It's Cole. <laughs> Thanks. You're, you're making me like weird with my swearing. Uh, you know, Enzo is producing this. And uh, so, like, uh, I'll drop a shit, but uh, I'm not going to drop an F-bomb. I'll take care of that. Fellas, close your ears. <laughs> yeah. Actually, it's being funneled right into his right brain. Right into him, yeah, as he has the, has the headphones on. Um, but, yeah, so Tracy won. I mean, that was a phenomenal performance, and, and I, I expect to see her in top ten after probably uh, – Oh, yeah. I mean, there, there couldn't have – so I, uh, I was sitting there for that fight, and I was up in the nosebleeds for that. So um, just for me, like I told you guys uh, – I split from my job. I'm a free free bird now. And then I realized I had like five thousand dollars in uh, MGM in Vegas. So I was like, "All right, well, let me make a trip out of this. I'm gonna go get it, bring it back, whatever." So I bought like nosebleed tickets, thinking, "Ah, whatever." Nosebleed tickets suck. They're horrible. <laughs> they really. Do you cannot suck. see anything. Uh, you have to watch the screen the whole time. Oh, I was just watching the screen. You can't. It was like little ants marching down yeah, there. Yeah, it was way too high up, and I don't want to be like bougie especially now that I'm unemployed, like that's all I can you afford. You can't afford to be yeah, bougie. I can't afford to be bougie. Uh, there's no point in going. If you're yeah. going to sit in the nosebleeds, just stay home, order a pizza, whatever money you would have spent on the travel yeah. and the hotels, just stay just home. Just spend $70 on the event and then some pizza and beer. Yeah. So watching from up top, but watching the screen, um, first of all, I have to say Tracy's performance. I've trained with Tracy for a long time. You've trained Tracy for a long time. Um, wow. Was that impressive to me? I mean, you know, usually she she's grappling heavy. She gets on top. She beats girls with pressure and and wrestling and grappling. She just strapped her nuts on, stood in the pocket. She beat the hell out of her. That was super impressive. Yeah, one thing we did there is Tracy said at the even before camp started, she said, "Hey, I want to showcase my striking. I really want to work my striking, showcase this." And I said, "Nah, like that's I know you say that, but it's not going to happen." And she's like, "No, I want to do this. I want to do this." I'm like, "No, like we we can't put together a." striking heavy game plan for you because every time you get hit you're gonna shoot <laughs> and so she was like no i want so so what we did is we didn't grapple at all for this camp um i brought in kickboxers i brought in tiara brandt who is a phenomenal muay thai kickboxer and they only stand up sparred the first five weeks of camp tracy only stand up sparred we brought brought in nadia chamil who's a kickboxer as well um and then we brought in uh, maritza gosh is it sanchez who's a MMA fighter, but you know, she were, they were just doing stand up for the most part. Um, brought in a few other girls as well, and all they were doing was stand up, just brawling. And then little by little, we started grappling and doing some more cage stuff and, and implementing that stuff. But by the time the fight came, she was confident in her hands, and her hands have always been good. She just never had the confidence to maintain them when 
like the shit it was shit hit the fan. She get hit once she she get hit and be a little bit uncomfortable. Yes, even when she was winning. Yeah. It, it, and so she just threw down for weeks and weeks and weeks just hard. I mean, she was doing four or five five minute rounds of just stand up sparring with just kickboxers. And maybe that's what the difference was you're saying is the mindset. Cuz training with Tracy, I mean, she's always had really good movement, really good on the mitts, really good footwork, really good everything, but then you watch her actually train or spar and you're, you're right it just was a different mindset it was like this is a means to my end which is grappling yep exactly and i feel the same way personally like i know a lot of camuela used to be that same exact yep. way and then he switched his whole mindset and oh speaking of which oh speaking of which uh this podcast is brought to you by camuela kirk <laughs> uh no actually you know so i these aren't mounted yet uh, we're gonna switch some stuff up in here and i'm gonna hang these um but these are actually painted by our very own friend and UFC fighter, Kamuela Kirk. Uh, and if you, uh, we're going to have different ones uh, up. We're, we're going to switch some stuff around so they'll be mounted. But if you guys want to purchase them from Kamuela, DM him on Instagram. It's the Jawayan. Uh, I will put that Instagram link in the show notes. And so if you like these, and, and we'll rotate them out, different, different ones. He's got a lot of different stuff. He has everything from like um, Peaky Blinders to you know, gangs of New York to stuff up here, um, tons of different stuff. And, and he paints all of it, you know, of course, by hand. Like it's, they're actually his, they're not prints. And yeah, if you guys want them, DM him and pick them up, buy them, ship them out. Rather have his stuff up here than some random person stuff. Well, that was the next thing I was going to take up actually was art. Yeah, what, what do you got? Uh, I'll figure it out. It's going to be like kind of what you got in the back. There's just a bunch of blotches on the, okay. on the canvas. That's actually from There Will Be Blood. It's actually, if you've watched that movie, it's one of my favorites, <laughs> Daniel Day-Lewis. You're, yeah. All right. I'm Anyways, educated. to finish up, Tracy looked great. Awesome performance. Honestly, awesome event. Um, personally, I had a lot of fun. So I was sitting in the nosebleeds. Um, oh, wait, even before we get to that, because yeah. you said awesome event. Man, I was a Shevchenko 10-8 round away from sweeping the card. Um, I think we killed it on that. Everyone made a lot of money. Yeah, it was a gr honestly that this week was a make or break week. Uh, make or break week for me, right? I don't have consistent income coming in anymore, so I said, "Hey, I'm gonna literally gamble on myself, like literally gamble on myself." And luckily, I had such an awesome week, so that's gonna tide me over for a while. Let me still have the kind of financial freedom that I had before, even without a, a second income or first income, I guess. So very, very lucky. Super awesome week. Everybody on the Patreon did super well. Uh, honestly, I think everybody in general did well. Yeah, I think as um, a whole. I think as a whole, everyone the did one, well. The one bomb I just wanted to stay away from was Padilla because I, I just I had a horrible feeling. You and I talked about it. Lacerda and Padilla, the two that we were like, ah. And, uh, sorry, not Lacerda. Ch Chirus, yeah, no. Was, yeah, but, yeah, but the Lacerda the, fight. Lacerda fight, yep. Chirus. And I thought he looked great until he got caught in the little that thing. weird little thing, yeah. A and so that who said, I, So I, I, I think I picked – I said Padilla is probably going to win. I said I wouldn't touch it. That's the bomb of you know Parley Buster of yeah. the week is that one. Um, and, and then I I actually had it on the Patreon. I had it written out and I pulled it off. But I told Mark Raimondi, I told you this. We were at the press conference with Tracy, and the Padilla Nelson fight came on. And he's like, "Oh, this guy, you know, Padilla is really good." Blah blah blah. I said he's. I think he's going to lose. This is the Parley Buster, yada yada. And he did. That said, I. I think I thought he won. I think I think he got robbed. I Sitting cage side, uh, I thought he won as well. Yeah. I thought he won the first and the third round. The second round, I thought he lost pretty, pretty yeah. handily. Yeah. You got, let us know in the notes if you guys thought the Nelson fight was a good uh, call. I thought – and I wasn't watching it super closely because we were at the press conference. 30-27 Nelson was a tragedy. Was, is crazy. There was a lot of bad scorecards yeah. on this fight card. Yeah, 10 eight Correct or, winners, I think, for the most part, but yeah. bad scorecards. I agree with that. Um, let's get into this event. All right. If you're down. Oh, what, what, one other thing I just wanted to, to share about that. So thank you, Casey O'Neill. She got me tickets, like, cage side. Nice. So I didn't have to sit in nosebleeds after Tracy's fight. Me and uh, actually Casey Tanner, we went down. Uh, okay. So I was chilling with Casey Tanner all week, be, or like after that. And so we went down and sat sat front row and got to watch everything. So thank you, Casey. And then I went to um, I went to open that the next day at the Tenth Planet, and it's all UFC fighters, all Jiu Jitsu world champions, super cool. So I got to roll with Patchy Mix um, right when I got there, and I was up till like five in the morning. Stumbled out of bed, went to the wrong 10th planet, then found the right one. I was like late, super late, everything. But I rolled with Patchy, and he was like, man, you got a good game. And it was really cool just the mat is drenched. It's just you're sitting in 
literal pools of everybody's sweat. And then uh, they said, all right, we're done rolling for the day. And then Patchy came up to me and was like, hey, can, we, can I roll with him again? Talking about me. So me and Patchy just kind of rolled just in front of everybody. So that fun. was super fun. He's fucking good. He's, yeah. uh, he's, he's good for a reason. He's good for a reason, exactly. He's winning for a reason. Um, yeah, a lot of good talent in Vegas. There's not a lot of coaching. The gym situation is kind of weird up there. Um, but, man, the, the talent pool up there is, is unbelievable. Um, man, before we get into this card, you guys, check out the Patreon, the Discord. It's in the show notes. Come say hello. Um, it's 25 bucks a month. And then, you know, if you want to pick up my memoir, I've got that there as well. Let's go, man. Um, first fight, you can definitely start with this. Uh, Monster Rendon versus Tamiris Vidal from Brazil. All right, yeah, I'll start on this one because I'm seeing a lot of takes. Um, I have a friend who I met. Uh, I don't think he watches the show, so I can speak kind of freely about him. Okay. Uh, no, I'm just kidding. He's a good guy. He's a huge parlay guy, so not the best style of betting, but I guess I do the same thing, so how can I talk? But I met him at, like, a, the DraftKings suite. This was years ago, like, right after COVID, first event after COVID, all that stuff. And usually when you meet people in those suites, it's all losing gamblers, right? Because – that's who DraftKings is trying to woo, so they're going to put you in the DraftKings suite, all that cool stuff. Uh, so I met him. He just takes really high risk, high reward. And the dude, the dude does make a lot of money most times. Um, and, and then, you know, every time he loses a huge bet, he's like, oh, never bet on women again. That's his, his decree. I will never bet on women again. And so this week, he's, you know, showing his plays, and he's like, he's like guys, fellas, this is my big slam, 10000 on this one. And it's got Tamar's Vidal in it. <laughs> and I'm like... Man, really, from the guy who always says no more women, uh, this is the one that you're going to go for. You know, listen, I, I don't think tomorrow's I – think, I think everyone's getting soiled on the Brazilians. Uh, Natalia Silva, Karine Silva, all these, these like high-level uh, Brazilians, I think are ruining it for the rest, right? Tamara's Vidal, what has she ever shown on tape to be a minus 200 favorite over anyone in the world? Like if she was fighting Enzo right now – what has she shown on tape to be minus 200 over any of them? You know, she's getting smashed on the whole time, drops down for a heel hook, wins that fight. You know, she beat Ramona Pasqual, who's Ramona Pasqual, and probably was losing before that. She quitting from, you know, quitting from everything. She just quits. She's got, honestly, her striking's not great. Her cardio's awful, and then she looks her ways out of fights. So for her to be minus 200 over a girl who, you know, everyone's like, her tape is awful. Like, it's not that bad. She's strong she's aggressive she throws high volume she presses forward um i don't think vidal is the same brazilian that you guys are kind of looking for in in natalia silva and, and these unknown brazilians that keep popping up i think she's the one that's being brought in to lose right she was brought in to lose to Haley cowan she was brought in to lose all these girls she can't even make weight she's chubby she's not all you know gassed out of her mind for me i mean this is montserrat montserrat's fight i like montserrat here better cardio, better striking, like honestly can put together a complete fight. And everyone wants to say split decisions with Brittany Cloudy. Cloudy's good. Cloudy's got a good hand. She's tall. She's, she's a tall sip of water for the women's division. So um, I think that that record is skewed. You know, she's what, four and four, four and five now. Brittany Cloudy's a lot better than what her record shows. And she even gave Haley Cowan all that she could take too. So uh, I got Montserrat in this one. Uh, I feel good about that. Okay. Of course, I didn't tape this. You know that, right? Oh, people are going to be furious with you. Yeah. People how, get da how dare you coach Tracy Cortez? Yeah. And, and yeah, you don't watch women's MMA. I didn't tape the other one right after this either. But I am going to talk about that one a little bit. Okay. Go ahead. <laughs> um, we've got Hannah Goldie and Mizuki Inoue, in a way. Um, and, and I feel confident in saying that there's, Hannah Goldie has no shot here. Um, Why do you say that? Because Hannah Goldie is Hannah Goldie. And she, I think, is very – is so low level. I, I think her win over Whitmire with the armbar – man, Hannah Goldie is short – even for like the way she fights and she just square and boxy. We need to stop seeing Whitmire hate on everywhere. I think Whitmire has skills and that's why it pained me that fight of Hannah Goldie winning. Yeah, no, I, I thought Whitmire was going to win that fight and then she threw the armbar. That's what I mean. It's like, like, me that's crazy. a weird one. Um, we were at that. Were you at that event? I know I, I was at that event, but I don't know if you were there with me. No. Nope. Um, so I was at that event and I was shocked, but Hannah Goldie, she's got a good Instagram. Um, Solid. Like, 
we were with her when she was cutting weight one time. She's like wearing a thong at the fighter, like sauna, with like wearing nothing. And I didn't even realize it was a fighter because it just seemed like so out of place with what was going on. I think she blurs the line between masculinity and what's attractive. She almost yeah. makes me question things. Right. But she, her skill set is really bad. It's really bad. She's six and three in her career. Um, she, let's see, she, the Whitmire fight. Um, she won a decision on um, contender. Lost to Granger, Belbitza, Molly McCann, in, in just horrible, I mean, just, ah. So, and then you have Inoue, who's won 14 fights. Um, you she's saying not, that's enough. She's not a world beater. She lost a decision to Amanda Lemos. That alone means that she's going to beat Hannah Goldie. Because that, you, think, you think that Lemos could put away Hannah Goldie. I think uh, Enzo and Lennox, who are both in the room. No, Enzo's here taking Lemos. offense to this. He just said that Vidal, I was like, Vidal would be, shouldn't be minus 200 over Enzo. He took offense to that. Yeah, he's getting annoyed for us referencing him <laughs> over here. Um, we're going to keep doing it. She also had a split decision loss to Verna, Jandaroba. Yeah. Um, she actually knows how to fight, and Hannah Goldie has a really cute Instagram. Does does um, a three year layoff and Hannah Goldie being extremely active have anything to do with anything? Nothing. I don't care. Nothing changes for me. Wow. Well, okay. um, bet everything you've ever owned, you guys. Like <laughs> oh, your God. all of your organs. <laughs> oh God! <laughs> Every time I do that, that oh boy, Brandon's like, please who's don't, the, there was this don't, guy last don't. week because I, I told you uh, like I was on the Clinch show and. Um, Everyone was like, oh, he's so arrogant. He's, he's all this stuff. All right. Sorry. I'm trying to teach my son how to, how to use the video switcher, you guys. So if, uh, if I'm over here talking on a monologue and the camera is just on Brandon just doing nothing, you guys will know why. Because Cole it's cheap labor, didn't though. show up. Yeah, I'm actually paying him $10 for this. You get what you, you, get what you pay for. Yeah, I'm paying $10, which is actually more than we pay hole but uh, what, <laughs> no, whatever uh, yeah yeah i know I, I wish it was so all right um yeah this guy was like he was like i've fallen this is hilarious he goes i've i i kind of read it what are those old commercials like where you have to donate to the dogs and they play oh, yeah. the really sad music sarah mclaughlin yeah, yep. he's like i have fallen victim to santino and brandon saying this is a lock <laughs> don't fall for it again don't do it. Don't but he would drop it. the comment on every single person's comment on our page, on Clint's page. He was just copy and pasting the same comment underneath other comments. Oh, was, uh, <laughs> always using our name or whoever it is. No, our there. names, our names. That's like, funny. I have fall. Don't fall victim. To, it was like a class action lawsuit against us. <laughs> don't fall victim to Santino's lock of the week. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. All right, next up we've got uh, – oh, are you going to talk in no way, Goldie, or are we done? Uh, okay, I, I think – Make it quick. We don't care yeah, about In a way, it's fine. In a way, it's fine. I don't like the time off. Uh, Goldie's strong, so she always has that nuclear option, I guess. She but swings strong, hard enough. But it's not like she hits hard. I think she hits hard if she uh, could hit you, but she can't reach. A little nub arm. Yeah, I think in a way is going to win, and, uh, I, I, you know, yeah, that's fine. Let's move on. All right, we got Jake Collier, uh, Muhammad Usman. I'll actually kick this off because I've contributed nothing up until this point. Um, <laughs> Neither of us have. We just gave two breakdowns that was like in the clouds. Yeah, in the clouds. So Usman, gosh, he's horrible um, at fighting. He's athletic. Uh, he Careful now. Careful what you say. He's, uh, he hits hard. Haymakers. But his skill, like... He looked decent. Who was the fight? Who, who? Junior Tafa? No, the one before that. Zach Pawanga? Um, Zach Pawanga. Um, Panga. Yeah, like, he, he looks okay there. Against Tafa, man, he is just head down, left overhand, right overhand. Like, he'd never thrown a punch before in his life. Looked horrible. Got the takedowns, and that's what saved him in the fight, was, was getting those two takedowns against a very, very, very basic wrestling grappler defending in Tafa. Um, if Tafa had a little bit more grappling defense, he's winning that fight 10 out of 10 times. I mean, we could say that for every fight ever if he had a little bit more. No, I, I'm just saying in the striking range, just in, in a kickboxing and battle. In, in fairness to Usman, Tafa was grabbing the cage so badly yeah. every single time. That, yeah, like... exactly. But, but Usman looked really out of his element striking with Tafa. It was crazy. Uh, but... That said, you have Collier on the other side. And 
Collier actually is, I mean, maybe Usman knocks him out in round one, but Usman had a hard time with Ponga in round one, and Ponga was actually, I thought, winning that, not anything crazy, but 10-9 the whole fight till it nuclear option, he died. Um, Collier is in your face. He comes at you, and he is a buzzsaw, and he is, he actually has pretty fast hands. He, he does two things that I actually like. Uh, he finishes with his jab. He'll throw combinations, throw a right hand, and then he finishes with that jab because most people just don't expect it, and they expect that hook. He actually has a decent hook as well. He comes in big. There's not a lot of power on it, though. And, and Collier throws a lot of volume and is in your face and is a buzzsaw. But, again, he's not knocking people out, and he death gasses after round one. Well, maybe not even round one, maybe like three minutes. It, exactly. So you've got a guy in Usman who's not great, but – his cardio is fine, especially for as big as he is and as hard as he throws. It's not amazing, but it's better than Collier's. And if Collier had a, a power or a finishing option, man, I would bet the, the house on Collier. But without that scare of a finish and with the style and the way that he death gasses, I think that – I don't even think the threat of Usman's inactivity is going to do much because I think Collier will gas so much that I think Usman will really come on in round two and round three. Um, I like Usman here, and sh I'm not afraid to say it. Uh, yeah, man, I, I went into this uh, really, really wanting to like Collier here. I was like, I hate I hate betting on fighters that I know have zero skill set like Usman. And I was like, man, he's he's horrible. Um, I picked Collier in a lot of fights, like Arlovsky. Like, I always fall for the Collier trap. And uh, my bald friend, uh, best fight picks, Dan, he said something and it was like it was like really relatable. He goes, every time Jake Collier fights, they treat him like Jared Vandere, uh, where you're like convincing yourself he's gonna win. He's gonna win. No, 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 this is the one he's gonna do it. And I was like, I couldn't think of a better comparison because we always go, man, this is the week that he wins, finally. And then he always finds a way to lose. Um, man, his last few fights have been against all fat slobs. Every single one of them has been fat slobs. And Usman isn't good, but he's not a fat slob. And yes, he is gassy a little bit, but probably less than the other couple guys that he's fought too. So as long, like literally the only way that I would play this fight is call your knockout round one uh, because that's the only shot that I feel that he has or, uh, or Usman's going to take this. And like you said, I don't think that Collier has a ton of power, so he's really going to have to put it on Usman early. You know, if, if, if he sits back, like, honestly, I think that Usman's going to put him against the cage and just athletic him, right? He's just going to put him on the cage, go for takedowns, make Jake work, make Jake work, make Jake work. So even if Jake wants to be chill and not do this, I think his body is actually just so much smaller than Usman's because he's a fat middleweight as opposed to a natural heavyweight. Um, yeah, at the end of the day, this is almost like the recipe for a women's fight. It's just the guy who's like a little bit bigger and more athletic and can cage push a little bit better, I feel is going to take this one. Um, again, I'd love to bet Collier, but for me, I think uh, Usman is, is, the, uh, is the play here. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, all right, let's move on. we got a lot to, lot to get to. Next up, we have uh, Jacob Malkoon and Cody Brundage. Uh, what do you kick this off? And uh, I know you love some Cody Brundage. Yeah, well, you know what's funny mm -hmm. is that um, – I'm going to – oh, this is weird. Okay. Jacob Malkoon is everybody's darling this week. This is everybody's lock. Um, I am going to avoid this one like the plague. I'm not going to touch it, not going to play it. Um, I have to really sit down with myself in the mirror and decide if um, Cody Brundage is going to be a button that I press this weekend. Um, nothing against Malkoon. I think Malkoon is super, super good at what he does. He's very basic, decent boxing, grabs a single leg and rides that thing into the ground, and he's very, very good at that. And Brundage is like the complete opposite. Brundage, like, it's flash and show and does all this stuff. And then his fundamentals are really poor and he makes really bad decisions. Um, however, I feel that this is kind of like the contender series fight that just happened between Allen and Jacoby. Um, Allen, to me, moved so much better and just looked like more athletic and cleaner. And Jacoby is very good and very talented. And I think he could be in the UFC, but very like, stiff and foxy and robotic and it's weird that this is kind of how i feel about this matchup is brundage moves super super well um if he had a coach just sit down with him and say stop jumping guillotines just defend takedowns i think we have a really competitive fight here um 
And I mean, again, after him running out of the arena crying, probably almost retiring a few times, maybe that will get it through his head. Stop making these awful, awful, awful decisions. Um, I, I am going to pass on Mel Kuhn. I think that Brundage could win this fight. And that's weird for me to say that. It's really weird for me to say that. But uh, I'm going to go Cody Brundage here. Now I just have to decide in my, my actual heart if, um, if I'm actually going to press a button on him. Most likely not. Most likely I'm just going to pass on this fight altogether. But I think Cody Brundage has the skill set, the versatility, can move a little bit, that he could possibly win this fight. The only way I see Cody Brundage winning this fight, and it's not a, the realm of possibility, is actually to jump a guillotine. And here's why, is Malkoon's number one favorite shot of all of his UFC fights. Head in the outside single leg, lifts it up, trips. And when you shoot a head on the outside single, you leave your neck for the guillotine. Um, other than that, I don't see a possibility. And, and the reason why I don't see a possibility of Brendage winning it is because he's so uncomfortable fighting. He, he wants out of there so much. He wants to be a fighter. And he likes to train, I'm sure. And he's had some success fighting. And he just doesn't want to be in there with punch for punch, battling it out. It, 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 and I say that not as somebody I, that I know him, just watching the way that he fights. He, he seems so uncomfortable. He's a friend of the show, so we got to be respectful. So he, like, he's got big explosive overhands, a beautiful blast double, but then his people start to build their way up. He attacks the neck and then jumps into the guard for that guillotine. After taking him down, instead of just going spin drill and coming up on top, stay on top, beat him, beat him, beat him, and then, then find a TKO or look for a rear naked choke or do it again and again through 15 minutes and, and get the win. Um, the thing with Malkoon is, is he's not great, but he's got a good jab. Um, he, he moves well. I, I could see I could actually see Brendage like landing a loopy haymaker early as well. Um, so it's not out of the realm of possibility, but I, I see a Hail Mary something having to happen for Brundage to win. And I think, I think Malkoon is, he's tough. He's, he's durable. Um, I thought he beat uh, Brendan Allen. Um, and, and B. Allen, you know, has good guillotines and good submissions and good stuff. And if Brendan Allen isn't getting him out of there, I don't think that Brundage is going to get him out of there. And you're, you're probably right. I, th I just, for some reason, I have a weird feeling about this one. It's like everyone's loaded the boat so much against Brundage and people have talked themselves into Brundage bets so much. And I'm like, guys, do not do that. Do not do that. And against Malcoon, and I'm always betting yeah. on Malcoon. I hit him this huge underdog so many times that weirdly, I'm just feeling like the paths are crossing. And for some reason, Malcoon will slip on a banana peel, like skill for skill and IQ for IQ. I got Malcoon all day, of course. Just a weird gut feeling that he maybe slips on a banana. I get pill. it. You, sometimes I have gut feelings, and I'm 100% right. Last week I had a gut feeling, and I was 100% wrong. I picked him in the um, show, of course, and, and I, I said I like him, but Kapilov. I got spooked because everyone on the planet was so high on Kapilov on that Fremd fight, and they should have been, but it reminded me of uh, – was it Tamir? Tagir. Oh, yeah, Ullenbeck. We don't yeah. talk about him. And there was another one that we just – one of those ones where, like, we knew as much as we know our name, they're going to win, and they lost. And so that was just one of those ones that just felt the same. And I was like, you guys, I'm, I can't throw him on there. I know he's a smart play, but blah, blah, blah. And sometimes these things happen. But uh, I, I like Malkoon here. Uh, let's move on to uh, Tim Means and Andre Fialo. Our boy Rusty was looking at this one, asked, asked uh, what I thought of this. And – I have gone back and forth a lot on this because, and it sounds weird. I mean, you know, you think about it, Fialo is the guy. Like, it's like he's probably the A-side here. Like, what are we missing? Uh, but Fialo has lost three in a row. He's been knocked out three in a row. And not only has he been knocked out three in a row, he got rocked in both of his other fights. Yes. And he has gotten brutally knocked out in, in the fights that he's lost, R really good ones. And the thing with him is so he's two and four in the UFC. And then you have Tim Means, who's won a lot. The dude has won a lot of fights in the UFC. And then the other thing that really bothers me about Fialo is I don't think he's shown a single other wrinkle 
from his first UFC fight till his last UFC fight. He is always the exact same, and he's really good at what he does, but he's just there. Hands up, waiting, waiting, waiting. Tries to pull when you fire at him. Fire right hand. Maybe he'll counter with the hook after, or, or you know, follow with the hook. Um, you know, and Tim Means, man, Tim Means is, is not the most technical guy, but the boy can fight. Dirty bird. He's a dirty bird. And he's a southpaw, the, and both of them are counter punchers. Both of them like to get the other person to fire first. Fialo likes those big power right hands, and Tim Means likes fast three, four punch combinations. Tim Means on the outside, though, when both of these guys are just standing there doing nothing, Tim Means floats and fills the space. He rocks in and out. He kind of half jabs. He throws a little bit of stuff. And then what he'll, he'll actually do well is he'll throw that teep, that left uh, teep, and then he'll throw a left uh, cross to the body as he's kind of doing – he's doing something while he's doing nothing, all right? And he fills it. His timing on his takedowns are good. His, he, he's gotten his, his wrestling better. The, the real knock on Tim Means is that he's 39, and he doesn't really have, like, this big power. Uh, I, I think for me I, – I've gone back and forth on this one so, so much, and, and I don't know what – maybe it's because I've overthought it and I've watched – too much tape on it because because sometimes I, I will do that paralysis by analysis that's what they say yep and, and I, I definitely did that with this one here to me this is a fialo knockout um or deci- you know decision no bet because i think if it actually goes to a decision i think tim means wins this because i think the space i think he fills more space and i think he does more and i think it's almost like michelle pereira where he will just do enough to touch a move and touch a move. And, and Fialo, the other thing with Fialo, he looks great in what, round one. I don't know if it's he's getting hurt or his cardio or what, or if he just freezes. In round two of fights and round three of fights, it's like he has no idea what to do. He, if he doesn't get that like pull right hand, watch. Watch him in his round two fights. He's just like, uh, uh. And it's so cra- It's crazy. Weird. And yeah, the announcers yeah. are like, oh, I think he's still hurt. I think this – I don't know what it is. He doesn't know how to fight after round one. It's really weird to me. Um, I still, because we kind of force each other to make picks here, I want to say I believe Fiala is going to get it done. And here is why. The guys who he is fighting, um, Matt, what's the kid from Australia? Um, Matthews. Uh, oh, yeah, Matthews. Matthews. Uh, who did he just fight? Uh, Joaquin Buckley. And then who's the other one in there that knocked him out? Um, yeah, who was it? Who was the other one? Let me let me click on this right now. Um, off the top of uh, – oh, Muslim Salikov. And that was a beating, man. Um, the thing with those three guys is they all hit hard as hell. They are big, big, big power punchers. Um, Means is not. He's a volume guy. I, I think his best ho- punch is his right hook, which hooks are what tend to land on Fialo. But he also gets hit with straight rights from uh, orthodox fighters, which, which Fialo wants. And if he throws that straight left to Fialo, I think Fialo pulls and fires it over the top. Um, I, I think Fialo will still probably win, but, man, I do not have a lot of confidence in that. Uh, I've been back and forth on this one all week too. And as probably the biggest Fialo lover in the world myself, this one pains me because um, – I'm the biggest Fialho lover, but weirdly, th- this card is really annoying to me. This is like the least conviction I've ever had in a card, o- probably almost ever, where every single fight I'm like, well, this could literally go either way. Like there's not even one spot where I'm like, this is the one. Um, and-, and this is a spot like that. I've always loved Fialho's style, like just stand in the pocket, fire back, huge punches. I've always thought his, his striking was super educated and he hits like a, like a fire hydrant. Like he's just so powerful. Um, but you're right. Tim Means, I love the volume that he that he he puts three, four, mm-hmm. five punches together, and they may not be huge clubbing shots, like one one shot power, but they look like they hurt a lot. And the thing that I worry about Fialho, you're right. He he just turns into a different fighter round two, round three. What I worry about is that suffocating style of Tim Means, where he is putting those two, three, four, five punches together. That just suffocates Fialho. And I don't even know if it's always Fialho's chin going or if it's just him like. I'm good on this. I'm done here. Like, even with the Jake Matthews fight, every time he got hurt, it was just kind of like, uh, all right, I'm just done being hit like this. Um, 
I could see Tim Means drowning him. I could see Tim Means finishing him by just filling that space and suffocating him and putting those punches together. Um, the thing about it is I love Fialho. I love his power. Like, there's some cool things in his game. And it, honestly, it was a lot cooler when he was winning fights. Now that he's not winning fights, I'm like, ah, this style sucks. But, you know, that's, that's the times. Um, I, I think I'm going to have to go Tim Means here. I just I don't want to count on a knockout from somebody. I mean, we kind of talked about that a lot. Now, Fialho is a grappler. The one thing that was really alarming about Tim Means, look how fast he's tapping to submissions. Like, like comically fast. Like, the guillotine from Morono, like, barely touched his neck, and he's like, no, no, I'm good, I'm good, I'm good. Like, the, the Darce choke, or the anaconda, was, like, so comically fast, it was crazy. It almost reminds me of uh, Matt Schnell's double... Double fist hand, yeah, double, double hand tap out, which was yep. hilarious. But he's tapping so quickly. But, you know, fortunately, he's fighting Fialho, who can't spell BJJ. I think we're going to be in for, obviously, a striking match here. Um, and, and I don't want to count on someone to catch someone else's chin. I know he's 39, but, man, he does seem pretty tough and pretty durable. And I think he's got more than round one equity, where I think is Fialho's round one, maybe the first half of round two equity. So, yeah, for me... It, pains me i think i'm gonna go to means on this one okay the kind of what swayed me not not like i'm trying to sway you but i i was really thinking i was gonna go means kind of on most of the tape and most of every, everything and the reason why i finally teetered back over to fialo was one like i said the the power punching of the guys he's fighting means doesn't swing like that and if you watch i mean matthews and salikov they are swinging everything that there is and then the other thing is that... So do you think Fialho's power will keep Means away a little bit? Well, I, I, Fialho ate some really good shots from all of those guys before getting knocked out. And But now it's three in a row. Do you think that chin is... I don't know. You know what I mean? That's, that's, we can speculate, but I... He I, got I, dropped by bare-knuckle legend Cameron Van Cam. <laughs> that's true. Um, he, he definitely does get dropped or rocked at least a lot. And, and then, of course, dropped and, and killed... But so, so he has been hit by a lot of those guys, and those guys are really big power punchers. But the other thing is that with these guys both being counter punchers, the thing with means is means will fire fast three, four, five punches in the pocket and go. But when people touch Fialo, he's like an alligator's mouth. He will swing, and he will swing hard. And I think if these two are going blow for blow in the pocket, I think Fialo is going to get the better of him. Um, and that was kind of what swayed me. So – and, and I again, like you guys, I said I don't have a ton of conviction on this, but that's that's honestly why. there's so much action this yeah. week. I'm gonna pass in this one, or fight doesn't go. Yeah, like. there's there's a lot. So next up we have Miles Johnson, Dan Argueta. Uh, who do you have in this one? Okay, uh, again, Which, uh, you guys just really quickly. This is another one that's kind of oh, it yeah. could go this way, it could go that way, it could go this way. I think this, but then I think that. Yeah, it's gonna go a million different ways. Uh, Dan Argueta, I know super. Honestly, I know both these guys super super well. Um, Dan striking is atrocious 99% of the time. And when he struggles to get takedowns, I mean, life gets really, really hard for him. Uh, however, Miles Johns is like, you know, he has, like you said, he hasn't really shown a new wrinkle either. It's, it's low kick overhand, low kick overhand, bad cardio, low kick overhand. Now the thing is, is like, he's not fighting uh, sexy Mexi. sexy Mexi wears guys out because he's in their face so much, always feeling space and volume. And he's like the most game fighter in the world. Um, Argueta is a completely different challenge, but I think Argueta is going to make him wrestle a ton, a ton more than he wants to. And he's going to make those arms heavy. And even as bad as Argueta's striking is, um, he's going to be able to see those shots coming. And as long as he's not getting just destroyed with low kicks, uh, I see him eventually getting these takedowns, eventually getting top time. One thing I do like about Argueta, his body's super weird. He's so short and so wide. Um, and he's a wrestler, but he actually has really weirdly good jujitsu for being a wrestler of that build, right? Usually those like short, stocky guys are like take down, you end up getting back up, take down again. He can actually maintain top control, which is is super rare for just something someone his build. Um, I think in a closely lined fight, I like the the grappler here that that's got a little bit better cardio, right? We've seen him gone go five rounds gut out victories. Um, I think he can push a really high pace. And honestly, I know the Ronnie Lawrence fight was really short, but man, he looked good in that fight. He looked really good. Best he's ever looked. So I got to, you know, give me Dan Argueta here. I'm torn with this one because I, I like Argueta's grappling cardio, but after round one, 
his hands drop and he gets very square. And I think Miles Johns for for as limited as his skill set is, which is, you're exactly right, it is a right low kick and uh, overhand. He actually still keeps his hands high and he still has fast hands later in the rounds. Looking at this, I, I think, can Argueta get the takedown, which is yes. Can Argueta submit him in round one? And that is my my curiosity because uh, if he can't submit him in round one, I actually think I think Miles Johns' hands are going to pay dividends in that later second round, third round because of just how heavy Argueta's hands and shoulders get. He just gets so square, and I love his grappling. And you're right. His jiu-jitsu is good, and his control is good. His transitions are amazing. If he can't finish Miles Johns in that first round, it, like, he drops. Like, he's here, just hands, plods forward. And, and I really worry about that, uh, of him getting in there. Um, like you said, the only thing that Miles Johns throws is that big overhand. And if he would throw anything other than that, I think he could really starch Argueta. A jab. A jab. A Faint freaking knee. jab. Um, you know, we saw him with with our guy Kevin Natividad hit that uppercut off the break in round three. But Natividad doesn't have the wrestling that Argueta has. Um, Come on, that's rude. That's our guy. Um, he, do, he doesn't. Actually, his, his wrestling's really improved right now. Like, if you see him, I'm actually really excited for Kevin Nativity to fight again because we got him just for, for his last UFC fight against Tercios. And, man, I feel like if we had him one fight earlier, he'd still be in the show because he, he has improved so much. I can't wait for him to get back at it. Um, that said, I, I think Argueta can do enough to, to get him down, but I would not be surprised to see a late KO by Miles. That seems unlikely. All right, what do we got next? I don't even know. Um, another great one, Charles Jordan and Ricardo Ramos. Uh, I'm going to go Eric Jordan here. I think a few things. Uh, well, this one's interesting to me. If, if I was guaranteed Ramos was going to wrestle and use his grappling the entire time, I think it's Ramos because for the same reason we kind of just talked about, he's really good at getting guys down and then finding the back. He's mm -hmm. really, really clean, very, very good jiu-jitsu. Um, but as of late, too, he's really willing to stand and trade with guys. And it just seems like Jordan has the – he just has the swagger about him lately, right? I know uh, you know, I know he lost against Nathaniel Wood and everything, right? But Nathaniel who's Wood – Who's phenomenal. Who's phenomenal. He's, like, literally so good. Um, I, I think this is going to be a mostly stand-up affair. Uh, I like Jordan. I, I think he's probably naturally a little bit bigger than Ramos. Um, more weapons. And it, thinks, it seems like Ramos fades when he's not just dominating. Uh, and Jordan can put together a clean, solid 15 minutes, push harder at the end than he did at the beginning. Um, I really like Jordan striking. It's diverse. It's, it's different. He's really leveled up since we first started this podcast because I remember us talking about him before like, man, what a freaking bonehead. And sometimes he still is, but – I think he's got a really good swag about him. Um, a lot of tools in the arsenal. I like me some some Jordan here. I agree with everything you said except for his size. I think he's a tiny featherweight. And well, I then think they're both tiny featherweights. No, we're almost I, forty uh, former thirty fiver. I, I don't care. He's a big frame. He grew into it. I, I think, man, you you watch him and uh, Bill Algeo fighting. They're not too far from each other. Like, man, Ramos is a big featherweight, I believe, and Jordan is not a large human. Probably five seven, um, which is considered a midget. Five. For hey, come on, you guys. come on, come on, come on. Oh, oh, oh <laughs> sorry. No, Wait, you really um, think he's five seven? What's maybe, he listed at? Do you, I, I don't know. He's not big. I, I've five, been. Seven? I've stood next to him. He, he's not a big guy, and he's he's a small frame as well. Um, but but I like Jordan. Uh, he. I mean, he's listed at a putrid tiny five foot nine. Is he really? That's what he's, he's not. At. He's not five nine, dude. Charles Jordan is not. Someone five get out nine. the tape measure. Um, yeah. So uh, anyway, you know, he's he's fast. He's got good volume, and and he has that pressure. And the thing with Ramos is Ramos has really good wrestling, um, but his he fades a little bit. His cardio fades a little bit, and his striking it's not bad by any means, but it's lumbered. He he everything is big, and even his punches you almost can see them a mile away. His kicks you can see them a mile away. Uh, and then he loves his spins. You know, I, I actually think the only way that – so 
that's the only way. Ramos could get a takedown because his takedowns are really good. Um, you know, and he does the right stuff. But, uh, you know, actually, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of walk something back right here. He was taking Bill Algeo down, and Algeo does the right stuff. He turns, he gets back up to his feet. Jordan will play on his back a little bit and will stay there. Um, that worries me in terms of Ramos's cardio. Um, but I, I, I do like or I, I do like Jordan here. I like his volume. I like his conditioning. I feel like he's just getting better and better and better and better. Um, and I think Ramos is gonna fade. Holy shit! I wish we were getting the other Jordan. Jordan's brother. Oh, I haven't even. I don't even know. Phenom. Really? Like, like I watch Charles Jordan, who's been in the UFC for years and years, and then I watch his brother. I can't remember his brother's name. That dude is insanely good. And I'm like, I, I wish Charles would be getting some tips from his brother. Right. He's so good. But all right, we're both on Jordan here. Um, all right, next, uh, Brian Battle and AJ Fletcher. Um, I'll kick this one off. AJ Fletcher, man, he, he's good. He's just in the wrong weight class. His body isn't built correctly. And he just got a beautiful double, and he runs a double into a knee tap. His striking's not bad. It's just a little too short for the weight class at 170. Um, he, he's got to be 5'9". You know, he, he's not a tall 70-pounder. And he does kind of the Cody Brundage thing. Is he just makes too many mistakes. He scrambles too much. He jumps the guillotine, tries to finish. And instead of just getting on top and just taking his time, he tries to win too much. And if you're not really, really, really good at what you're doing, you're going to give up position. And he gives up that position a lot. I think he's going to get some takedowns on battle. I think battle could, if it gets that far. Um, it's going to be another three-second battle. I, I know. I, you know, I, I think he could get taken down. But battle's cool, calm, and collected. You know, got back up with Petrosky, who is a phenomenal grappler in his own right. Um, I expect battle to win this. And I think the UFC expects Battle to win this. I think they they gave Battle Renat Fakradinov, thinking that Renat was AJ Fletcher, and they screwed up because Renat was good enough to just take him down again and again and again. But again. Battle also took that on short notice. Oh, did he? Yeah, oh, yeah. He oh you're right. In. You're right. Yeah, you're right. Battle did fill in, um, and that one shocked us. We didn't. We didn't. I, I think we both thought Battle was going to win that, and he just got mauled. That was less less on battle and more of a decree on we thought Renat, we thought was, Renat not, was not the one. Yeah, but he's clearly looked very, very good. Yeah, so I, I think this is a battle fight. I like A.J. Fletcher. I Man, he really does a lot of good stuff. I think he, if he could just be patient and stay on top. That Themba fight was decent, but even that was a little bit too much scrambling for against somebody like Battle, who it's almost like Ricky Tercios. It's like the guy just scrambles so much if he would just do less. Like, he'd be better. Sometimes less is more. Uh, I like battle here. I think I like battle here, too. And it's it, it's weird because I've always said this about A.J. Fletcher. I, I remember us talking about him. Jeez, we've almost been at this for two years now. Yeah. This show. In a minute. That's crazy. Two years of doing this. Um, time is just flying by. Remember us starting this, like, what, November, December a few years ago. Um, but since then, you know, we, we've seen A.J. Fletcher come into the UFC. And this is what I've said every time. Um, he's beating guys exactly how he's supposed to, and he is as good as he can show us for, for, for how he looks. Like, he just is – he is good. He hasn't shown us a reason otherwise. Um, and since he's been in the UFC, uh, you're right. It's been a little bit interesting. He's shown cardio deficiencies. He's shown some striking deficiencies. He's shown some scramble deficiencies. Um, honestly, if they re ran back that Themba fight, as good as Themba looked in that, that previous fight, do you think that uh, – do you think that AJ wins that one if they ran it back? Um, I don't know. I, I really am not big on Themba. So I, I think he... Themba looked like the poster boy for EPO in that last fight. He looked yeah. incredible. And so, I mean, honestly, if they ran that back, I was huge on Fletcher in that spot, right? We had just seen Themba come off the horrible performance in Fury. Couldn't finish the old guy. Little did we know that guy cannot be finished. Didn't know that. Five rounds, Julius Holmes beating his ass. Didn't know that. Um, I think that fight's a lot different. AJ is very good. He's got very good boxing. His skills everywhere are very, very solid. But he, you're right, he's just too small. He's just at the disadvantage of his body. Um, I like Brian Battle. 
the one thing that scared me was him staying on his back so much against Renat, not even trying to get up. And I worry that we have something like that here, and it doesn't make AJ use enough energy. Um, battles looked good. Even the Gabe Green fight, I was just watching those tight punches today. His punches were tight, and they were powerful, and he obviously put them out in, what, 14 seconds? Um, I like battle. I got to go into battle with battle one more time. The thing is, like you said, with the Renat fight, he took it short notice. They've got to understand what AJ's going to do. Like, they've got to assume that he's going to try to wrestle, that he's going to get taken down. That he, that I think he's a little bit more, more diverse than that. I mean, I don't think AJ's scared to stand with him. No, but you have to know that he's going to shoot at some point. Some point. Like, at some point, he's going to, and Battle's going to win the stand. But Battle, like, lives in North Carolina. Like, do you think they have any semblance of education or game plans in North Carolina? Hey, it's a blue state these days. Uh, that doesn't purple. mean a lot. Might be a purple state. <laughs> I don't know. Um, all right. I my. my phone went off i gotta my uh camera doesn't work so it won't access my face and open it i so can I gotta... uh i can do it uh next one we're on the uh the co oh, marina co and uh waterson do you want to go i actually did tape this if you guys actually want to hear what i say um yeah okay i'll go i i think this is going to be a repeat of the last one i think that they're giving marina a uh uh a free square on this one not that michelle's bad by any means and no she is no she's not bad she is. She's not bad. But she went life and death with Luana Pinero, who is not the greatest striker and slows down massively, whereas Marina's not going to slow down. Marina throws elbows, knees, kicks. She's always feeling space. She's long. She's aggressive. Um, I like Marina a lot here. You know, I, I, Narco Cop said something, too. He goes, you know, this, this price on a kickboxing match is, is quite a lot. And I'm thinking, yes, I agree on that, like a kickboxing match, whatever. But the strikes that Watterson throws are just so ineffective. They're weird side kicks and punches that are landing in, in air. She shadow boxes 20 feet away. Yeah. And the only time she's really landing is Panero's in the pocket with her just swinging Who's five two? Who's 5'2"? Who's an inch shorter than her? And wants to judo throw her. I mean, I, I, I got Marina in this one. I, I like her a lot here. Yeah, it, she's not dealing with a wrestler. Um, Michelle Watterson is is exactly who she was 28 years ago in the first women's ultimate fighter show. She is going to throw a lot of kicks, a lot of spinning stuff before she spins. She's going to make a lot of weird grunts to let you know that oh, she's oh, going to oh. spin. Yeah. yeah. So, I mean, she's going to send a memo via pigeon carrier to let you know what she's going to do four feet away. And, and then Marina is tall and long, just, as a human, but she actually uses her jab well. But against when Michelle Watterson will switch stances, and, and generally she is a uh, southpaw, but she'll switch orthodox every once in a while. As a southpaw, Marina knows how to fight southpaws, and she's got a really good middle kick and a really good high kick that she lets go a lot, which keeps that left hand glued to the face on Watterson, and then she snipes that right hand. But I, but I like what she does though, is against a southpaw. Instead of always throwing the straight right, she will throw a right hook. And she'll throw that right hook to the body a lot, and then she'll step in as if she's going to throw it, but then she'll throw a head kick right there. Um, she is aggressive. The last time they fought, it was five rounds. So I think um, I think Marina was kind of holding herself back to make sure that she had the energy. I think in a three-round affair, I think Marina is going to beat her ass. Um, wow. Like, I, I don't see it any other way than a, a good old-fashioned beating going Honestly, on. Honestly, just think about this. How good is Yan Xiaonan? Phenomenal. Yan Xiaonan is so good. I thought Yan won that fight, but Marina came back from the depths to make that fight close, and she won that fight. Mm -hmm. And you're not, Yan is a phenomenal striker. Phenomenal. Way bigger than, than Michelle Watterson. Way better than Michelle Watterson. Uh, I mean, it's Marina. Yeah, this is a Marina one. Um, all right, man, we got the co-main, Bryce Mitchell and Dan Ige. This is one I've kind of gone back and forth with a lot too. And uh, Ige has looked really good lately. And Bryce Mitchell, of course, we last saw with Ilya Topuria. Um, without, have you looked at the line on this? It's, it's insane to me. So y you guys probably know, you know, I don't look at the lines until after I look at the fight and I watch who I think is going to win. Well, let me ask you, when you watched the film for this one and then you thought in your mind what the line was, did you say this is about a pick em? No, I thought Ige would be kind of a good, solid favorite. Yeah, okay. Me, me too. Somewhere and around and then seeing him as a, as a two-to-one dog, I was like, oh, okay, that's kind of crazy. Now, especially because 
Ige looked really good against Damon Jackson, and Bryce looked really bad against Ilya Toporia. Okay. <laughs> now nah, you're good. We're getting questions from the producer, you guys. Um, so Ige looked good. Bryce looked bad. First of all, Bryce is not a big uh, flyweight. He was in Vegas throughout the week. No, he'd be a big flyweight. Jeez, flyweight. He would be a huge flyweight. <laughs> Featherweight. I saw him and I was like, man, he's actually really small. Like, really small frame. I was, I was actually shocked. He's probably five foot seven. No, he's probably five eight. That's an. Or five, nine, five eight and a half. Let's he's pull not, it up. Let's pull he's it up. taller than you. Well, I don't care what. Look, I've stood. Like, you can say he's six foot or three feet. I stand next to you, Brandon, and I know how tall you are. This says he's 5'10". Actually, you guys, you guys and Brandon, we're talking about how tall and this and that. I, I don't really know. All I know is like how tall you are in relation to me and then how tall Bryce Mitchell is and this and that. I want to get the tape measure out on you. I'm not sure you're 5'7". Oh, I'm definitely 5'7". Listen, I don't pad my inches. I think, I think we're going to have to get the tape measure out at some point because I'm not buying it. I, I don't pad inches. I've been measured many times. <laughs> um, Bryce's rest. So all right, I think people overstate Ige's wrestling a lot. I am, have never been overly impressed with it. Well, you game planned against that specifically. Exactly. And I said when Zombie fought Ige, people are like, how are you going to deal? I was interviewed a lot for that. How is Zombie going to deal with Ige's wrestling? And I said, he's going to maul him in wrestling. And this is before the fight, and I said it with confidence. I said, if it was a wrestling match, these two men standing here with some singlets on, Zombie is winning that. And we saw what happened. Um, Bryce Mitchell actually does have good wrestling. Now, I was actually watching him warm up. Uh, he was coaching somebody in the Contender Series. And he was chaining some beautiful wrestling. I was like, wow. Like, that was, it was really nice watching him just mess around. And he looked really good. His striking is not great. Uh, but he does hit hard. He dropped uh, Barboza. He, he's got a good straight left, and he's got a good chin on him as well. That said, I, I, I've also been in the room where Ige is, is training with, uh, who's the PFL um, former champion at Featherweight? Um, he fought, uh, man, I'll, I'll think of his name. Yeah, I can't remember. And two-time NCAA runner-up. Lance um, Palmer? Lance Palmer. Um, and those guys are wrestling a lot together. So, so his wrestling is probably looking a lot better. Man, I I thought Ige was going to be the winner. I mean, not the winner. Geez, the, the favorite. And I was thinking, man, I see a way that Bryce Mitchell wins this. And then seeing the odds being flipped, it kind of freaked me out. I still think that Bryce Mitchell wins this um, just by wrestling. I, I think watching Evluev, Evluev, I thought won – Look at Dan Ige's face after fighting Evloev. And, man, like, I think Bryce Mitchell hits hard. I think his striking is not overly refined. But Dan Ige is not finishing a lot of people. He's got a, a win against, I think it's like Danny Henry. Um, he's got a rear naked choke early in his career. And, and then he has the, the Gavin Tucker fight, and the, which Gavin Tucker at the time was – that was a good win. Like, whoa, I think he – that win didn't age as well as we thought it was going to win. What aged for sure. Oh, he aged. And then um, Damon Jackson, we kind of know, is a little chinny as well. So I, I kind of like Bryce Mitchell here. Okay, yeah. I've been back and forth on this all day, and then I tweeted about it. And I don't want people to think that I'm, like, so crazy heavy on the Ige side. Um, I kind of thought the same thing as you. I'm thinking, like, even recency bias included, right? Because a lot of people were picking against uh, Ige in the landwear fight, right? Everyone was like, Okay. Nate, the train's going to win again. And I'm like, I don't think so. Not in this one. Um, you know, and, and the performances that Ige's had a, as of late. Um, and then, you know, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Getting my, my brain back. Dan Ige has looked good as of late and kept winning and, and looking impressive doing it. And then you had, uh, you know, Bryce Mitchell in the last fight. Bryce is a lot better than I remember him ever being. I remember, you know, betting on Barboza and being pretty pissed off when that fight went down. And not only did he dominate him in the wrestling and the grappling, but also in the striking was pretty alarming. And the fact that he wasn't afraid of him. But one thing I'll say is that 
that Barbosa is obviously very kick heavy, which plays a lot into uh, to to um, Bryce Mitchell's game, right? Because he's going to key in on those, go for takedowns, shoot takedowns right off that. Almost get Barbosa worried about throwing kicks because he's going to get taken down. Ige is almost all hands, right? He's just heavy hands, stays really nice and tight in that kind of that little bladed stance. Um, God, I, you, you know, I'm with you. I can see a world where Bryce just wears him out. The thing about Bryce is he doesn't F off. He just doesn't F off no matter what. If he was sick, if he wasn't sick in that Taporia fight, he still was pressing the action the entire time. Got Taporia down, chilled on top at the end of the first round. His striking was still hanging in the pocket, right? He was still there. Um, and then at some point it did look like he got tired and he broke, but like, man, Ige is going to have to play this one perfectly. He's going to have to keep him off his legs. He's going to have to make him worry about the hands early. Uh, and if he can do that for the first round, I think he's good. I think round two, then Bryce is probably just going to stand with him. I, I think if, if he gets those takedowns shut out early, I mean, this is an Ige fight. Um, but the difference though, between Topuri and Ige is Topuri's pressure. If he is in your face and he will force you to fight him nonstop, Ige doesn't have that same pressure. And so now Bryce gets to decide, do I want to stay at range? Do I want to shoot? He can breathe a little bit and think a little bit more clearly. Um, Tropuri is like, I'm there. You're for, I'm but forcing you to fight But watch that fight me. back. He really wasn't in that fight. He, he may have in, his, in, you know, in the Emmett fight, but not in this fight. After he stopped a couple takedowns, I feel like he was just right in his face going. Honestly, he just inched forward the whole time. He wasn't like pressing him like like Mark no, I don't mean there, frantically right? I just mean crowding his space yeah he, he Ige will back up and Ige is a gentleman like almost everyone in a sport is it's Sean Strickland he doesn't blitz you but he crowds your space and that Non-stop. makes people really uncomfortable and Toporia does the same I honestly at this number I have to go Ige at the number I have to go Ige uh man I think Ige's I thought he was going to be the favorite in this fight like I said recency bias I thought that Ige was going to be probably in the minus 150, 160 range. Um, I have to play the number on Ige here. I think he's just got such big power. I think the dude legitimately has good skills. Uh, his jiu-jitsu is solid, and his stand-ups are good too. I think he's he's a good grappler. The thing with Ige is he gets his back taken so much, and they, people ride out time. Yeah. That's the issue with Ige. I, Bryce isn't submitting him. He's not going to like play in the garden, ground and pound him. Ige gets his back taken. And then he just stays there. Damage versus control. I think that uh, yep. I think Ige is going to take this. So I, I'm going to pick Ige. I like the number on Ige. I'm not going to make my entire night hinge on yeah. Ige here. Um, but I, I think it's a good number on a good fighter. I think actually the smart play is Ige. Like I think, like I said, I, even before I knew the number, I, I, I was thinking, all right, common knowledge, the smart play here is Ige, the guy with the better hands and the, can defend the takedowns and has fought infinitely better people except for uh, Ilya, of course. Um, and, and then I was like, man, I could see a world where Bryce can get on his back and go, uh, I, I might flip with you. I'll, I'll jump on the Ige train. And remember last time I did this, uh, you have no conviction and you just let him talk you into something. You, you just don't feel it. And it was Sean O'Malley. Was it? Yeah. 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 I, no, I, I, like I said, I, I thought Ige was the smart play here, but I could see a world where Bryce wins, and I still do. But it's the line that it's at. Like, it's the, a competitive fight. It just These is. lines should either be a pick em or flipped based on the skill set and everything. And, and then there should be a world where Bryce can get the win. Bryce isn't finishing Charles Rosa, and he's not finishing um, Andre Feely after getting him to the ground. What, um, one last thing I'll say on this. Bryce dealing with some crazy women. I know a thing or two recently about dealing with some crazy women. It affects you. Just so you know, I just recorded that, and I'm going to use that in a court against you. <laughs> oh, God. Oh, God. Here we go. So that's why I missed the show, guys. Sorry about that. Anyway, all right. Uh, I'll Ige train it with you. Let's run a train on Ige. All right. Let's, let's run a train or what, – what, what, wait, what? All right. Main event. Um, before we get it, you guys, uh, if you like this stuff, hit up the Jawayan, our, our boy. Um, he's in the UFC. He can do some art things. He can do everything. He plays a guitar. He sing. can sing. Yep. He's athletic. Well, one day I asked him, he'd never done a backflip before, and we were just in the gym. And I was like, can you do a backflip? He's like, I don't know, probably. And he just did a backflip, just like jumped up and did a backflip. And I was like, ah, all right. And the doctor said he's got – never mind, never mind. No. <laughs> uh yeah hey also guys sponsor us yeah sponsor us somebody give us some money just like 
We'll promote your product. We'll put it right here. Uh-huh. Whatever Start it is, the whole I don't show. care if it's Condom Depot. Um, I don't care if it's Condom Depot. I don't care if it's yeah. LaCroix. It doesn't matter what it is, and we will sell our souls for the devil. Oh, and we're Kratom, cheap. them. I don't care. Cheap. cheap. Not that cheap um, anymore. I need to make up some bills. Yeah, we're che- I'm cheap. He's jobless. I can be so bought. Talk to Santino, I guess, if you want yeah. good advertising for, for less. Uh, check out the Discord, you guys. Come hang out. Have fun. Uh, Fazeev, Mateus Giamrat. Go. Um, Fazeev, I guess same, same thing. Five-round fight worries me a tad bit. Um, I wish it was three rounds. I would load the boat on Fazeev. But... Gamrod has been getting rocked almost every fight now, and, and that style is starting to wear down and starting not to work as well. Um, Fazeev's got really good takedown defense and huge power and body kicks to, uh, to keep Gamrod off of him. Pardon me. Those, uh, those drinks are getting to me. Sparkle water. Jeez. Sponsor us. Yeah, um, I'm just going to keep it really simple. I think Fazeev's got huge power. I mean, he's got some of the most beautiful striking that I've ever seen. Five rounds sucks, but... Um, and the thing is, Gamrot has always shown that he can keep a five-round pace, diving at ankles all the time. But I think Fazi is going to be the biggest power that he's faced in a long time. And uh, I think that's going to be a big difference maker here. So I got Fazi. There's a lot to compare on this one. With Gamrot, you've got uh, Kuchaladze. And that's going to be kind of a similar game plan with Fazi. Sprawl and brawl, and defend and, and come up. And, and man, we're all shocked at how well Kuch to Ladze did with this in comparison with his last fight where he just looked horrible. And we're like, what the hell was that? Then, so you've got Gamrat who shoots these low singles. And honestly, the, the wrestling, a lot of those guys with ATT is just solid. I, I think it's some of the best in the game right now. The way that they're chaining real wrestling into MMA and making it work is gorgeous. Then you have like the guys up in Philly who are cage wrestling so well, which is gorgeous. Um, then you have Fazeev, who is at Kill Cliff, and I'm not impressed with their MMA wrestling as a whole. They've got Greg Jones, who's one of the best American wrestlers, three time NCAA D1 national champion from West Virginia, but was actually more of a counter wrestler in his own right. But that doesn't mean he doesn't understand oh, offensive wrestling. wrestling, but he never fought. And I, I, don't, I don't know how much cage wrestling he has actually done. And I think most of the wrestling is like open mat doubles and singles and, and just regular wrestling that we are used to. Um, and, and I just don't think it's that effective. It, not, I mean, I mean, in the grand scheme of things in relation to what ATT guys are doing in the cage wrestling and stuff like that. So, so there's that. Um, and, and I don't think Fazeev has fought anybody who wrestles the way that Gamrat does in MMA. We saw him with RDA, but RDA is the traditional cage wrestler, double power stuff, and, and so he did that well. Then on the other side of that, you've got um, Gamrat and Sarukian. And Sarukian, I think, is a much better wrestler than Fazeev. Agreed. And he, those wrestling exchanges were gorgeous, unbelievable. They were amazing. But Sarukian doesn't have the striking that Fazeev has. And you said it's a five round fight. I think three rounds, Fazeev just starches him. N- not starches him, but I think he understands the pace and everything. We've seen Fazeev with RDA um, in five rounds. I think he put him away in the fourth or the fifth. That was the, that was the knee. But RDA just wouldn't die. But RDA is doing the same standard stuff that he's used to push him against the fence. Fazeev's good with it. Whatever. Um, really, I'm just stalling here, you guys. Like, I'm just like, I'm just, I'm just stalling. No, um, I like, I think this is going to come down to damage versus control. And, and I think Fazeev is going to do the damage. If Gamrot did a little bit more damage when he got takedowns and stuff, I think I, I could heavily lean Gamrot, especially in a five round fight. Gamrot looks a little bit like Darren Headlights when he's striking with most people. Now he's going to get one of the best guys in front of him. Yeah. That can also defend takedowns. That can defend takedowns. And, and is extremely athletic. Yeah. I, I think I think Fazeev wins this. I think he's got to make sure that he does a lot of damage in rounds one, two, and three before those later rounds. Because Gamrat has a lot of five-round experience. And he beats people like – he beat, he breaks him in that fourth and fifth round because he keeps a pace. Any he, worry that he's been wearing glasses lately? Who, Fazeev or Gamrot? Gamrot. I, I don't know that that matters to me. Okay, I mean, it matters to me. 
Uh, maybe he's always just worn contacts, and now he's wearing glasses. It's always fun beating up nerds, but. I think he's a nerd's getting beat up. Yeah, um, yeah. I, I lean Fazeev, but it's hard to it's hard to doubt the cardio and the wrestling chops of Gamrot. Uh, I think the over is good here. Gamrot has never been finished. I don't believe. I think he's. Yeah, I don't think he's ever been finished. Um, I think over two and a half is a play. I, I think. I don't know that anyone's getting finished here, and if it is, I think it's Fazeev finishes Gamrot. I w- I'm thinking the under. I think that Fazeev's going to finish him early. Oh, really? You think uh, so? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Okay. Um, interesting. I, it's a close. I, I'm actually – this is funny because I'm critical of a lot of UFC fights and fight cards. This one I don't think is great for betting. Last week I thought it was amazing for betting, and I hated the card as a whole. This one I don't think is great for betting. And I love it as a fan. I cannot wait to watch all these of these matches. fights on this. This yeah. is a really exciting fight card. So uh, happy betting, guys. We'll see you next time. Um, we're going to keep watching tape to put – I know I'm going to keep watching tape to put my love them and like them picks out there so I can get – you know, we're we're pretty ambiguous on a lot of these. Like, oh, they're, they're very opaque, these winners. So Well, the um, good thing about all this is that there's more than the UFC. Uh, this week, guys, we have Bare Knuckle in Denver, uh, big title fight there. We have the LFA, which I, I have a couple spots on there that I like. Um, we have a lot. We have Bel- 21 fight Bellator card. Um, there's a lot to like. There's a lot this week, so it's not just the UFC. So we're going to put something together. Um, I've been putting together a lot of good stuff lately, and it's it's all been hitting. So um, we'll find our spots. We don't have okay. to force it. I think it's yeah, a good don't, And don't force spots that you don't. Like, I mean, these these gray area fights, just enjoy them. There's I can't much, afford to anymore. Yeah, there's so, too much good stuff out there. Yeah. Uh, all right, you guys, have a good one. We'll see you next time. Uh, oh, before we go, we wanted to bring Enzo on here. And whoever tracks our picks, Brian XLC or well, what is it on Twitter, Brian? Um, I, I don't know. I'm sorry. I, I'm the worst with names and stuff like that. Uh, Enzo has been picking some, some good stuff. Uh, so he's going to run over. Just give a couple quick picks of who he thinks is going to win. So if you guys, uh, Brian, if you can track this, I'm curious to see if Enzo does a does a better job than us. So um, hit it really quickly. Let's go. All right. So uh, I got only two picks. I don't know really anyone on this card. So I'm shocked to see that Bryce Mitchell is a uh, is a huge favor. I got Dan Ige. I think he's just going to completely maul him. And then Fazeev's going to like. Absolutely, just destroy Gamrot. And uh, my only analysis about the uh, Gamrot one is I can knock out Gamrot in UFC 4, but I can't knock out Fazeev. So Th- There you have it. Nothing but science and facts coming from Enzo, you guys. So um, see if he gets it right.